It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Perez coming to you from Baltimore. Venezuela keeps making headlines around the world. Two major airlines just announced that they can no longer fly to Venezuela because they cannot exchange tickets bought in Venezuelan currency into dollars. Coca-Cola said that they would stop uh, producing Coca-Cola in Venezuela because they cannot get the sugar that they need. Reports that basic goods and medicines are increasingly difficult to find in Venezuela without having to wait in lines for many hours. These stories are being circulated throughout the Internet. Meanwhile, the opposition wants to recall President Nicolas Maduro and has begun the first steps of submitting signatures to initiate the process, which the National Electoral Council is still assessing. With us to discuss these developments is Mark Weisbrot. He recently returned from Caracas. Mark is the co-director of the Center for Economic Policy and Research in Washington, and he's the author of the recently published book, Failed, What Experts Got Wrong About the Global Economy. Thanks so much for joining us, Mark. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks for inviting me. So, Mark, uh, the oil prices are back up at $50 a barrel. Will this improve uh, the way in which the government is able to deal with the current crisis, the economic crisis? Well, I think that will help. But I think there's a number of economic reforms they're going to have to make to allow the economy to recover from the recession and also from the inflation. You have kind of an inflation depreciation spiral with the very high inflation and a black market for the dollar, which is enormously different from the official uh, rate of exchange. So these are problems that are going to have to be resolved so that the economy uh, can recover. And you recently attributed this problem of inflation to what you say is an inflation depreciation spiral. What is that and how is it impacting the Venezuelan people? Well, since 2012, actually, end of 2012, you know, the economy actually did very well up through 2012 for going back to 2003 when they got control, the government got control over the oil industry. And you did have an enormous reduction in poverty and improvement in living standards. And that's why the government still has uh, a base of support. But things uh, deteriorated in the last uh, few years. And it was uh, this inflation depreciation spiral basically happens when there's a, a shortage of dollars uh, and a black market is created. And so people buy dollars on the black market and importers and producers buy dollars. And as that black market rate goes up, it pushes up inflation because imported goods become more expensive. And then as inflation goes up, uh, more people go into the black market because they want to buy dollars as a store of value. And so that process uh, continues and it's continued all the way through last year. Inflation was 180%. So uh, that's a big, uh, a very big problem. And also it means the economy can't recover while you have that uh, spiral because anything that the government, if the government tries to have an expansionary monetary or fiscal uh, policy, as you know, say we did in the United States uh, to get out of the Great Recession, that just kind of feeds into that spiral and you can't really uh, grow. So that's those are some of the. What is the issue with uh, dealing with the black market? Why why doesn't the government just shut it down? Well, they're thinking about it. The way to do that would be to uh, unify the. And there's definitely. I mean, the uh, to unify the exchange rate and the vice president uh, for the economy, uh, Pedro Zabat just said, uh, I think yesterday, that they were considering uh, floating the exchange rate. And so I think that's one of the things that will have to be resolved. There's others too, you know, but if they were to do this and they're gonna have to get rid of some of the price controls, uh, they could uh, stabilize the economy and return to growth uh, fairly quickly. Now. There is also an economic and political war against Venezuela. That's uh, actually true, even though the media pretends as though that's just a government excuse. Uh, that is part of the story. You know, President Obama, again in March, for the second time, uh, declared that Venezuela is an extraordinary 
security, unusual and extraordinary security threat to the United States, which, of course, ridiculous, I mean, on the face of it. So, Mark, that's really important. Now, the government of Venezuela claims there's an economic war going on against Venezuela. What do they mean by that? Well, that actually is true. I mean, there's a when the United States declares, as President Obama did in March for the second time, that the Venezuela is an extraordinary security threat uh, to the United States, which is, of course, ridiculous on its face. But that has a real impact. You know, uh, financial institutions that wanted to arrange a swap for Venezuela's gold, for example, a couple of years ago, they couldn't do it. And they, uh, you know, investors that want to invest in oil production there, for example, they're not going to do that because they don't know what comes next. When the U.S. puts a country really on an enemy's list, look what happens to them. Look what happened to Iraq. Look what happened even with the sanctions in Russia. They don't know what's going to be next. So that really damages the economy. And at the same time, the U.S. government is also in kind of a full regime change mode that you can see in the media where they're trying to promote, as they have uh, for the last 14 years, regime change. But it's it's actually accelerating uh, right now. You can see this in the, in the, in the whole media onslaught, uh, the idea they want to get rid of this. They see that this government is weak now, and they want to get rid of it. And that causes economic and political instability as well. Mark, you're an economist, and you've been studying Venezuela for a very long time now. Uh, what advice do you have for them when it comes to getting a grip on the exchange control system? Well, um, you know, I've been writing about this for a while now, and I have argued for some years that they should unify the exchange rate system, that is, just have one exchange rate. Um, and instead of the F2, actually, official rates, uh, and one, of course, there's also the black market rate in addition to those. And you can have just one exchange rate, which is what, you know, almost every country in the hemisphere actually every country in the hemisphere now has. Um, and that would get rid of a lot of the distortions, corruptions, the draining of reserves, the capital flight, a lot of the shortages. That would be one uh, big step and to get rid of the black market altogether. You see, right now, the government is subsidizing uh, essential imports like food. Uh, through the exchange rate by offering, uh, you know, a very cheap, cheap dollars and other subsidies, uh, they're subsidizing, subsidizing the sellers and the producers. But that's a very inefficient way of doing it. And of course, when you have a black market, it also encourages enormous corruption and arbitrage. Anybody can get cheap dollars, can make a fortune selling them rather than importing something and selling it at a low price. So uh, the idea is you, you have to change this system of relative prices. And, and you can subsidize the majority of people with low-cost food and other essential items directly instead of trying to do it indirectly through the exchange rate. That's the basic, most basic, I think, reform they need. They have gasoline that even... Uh, even with the recent price increases, almost uh, free. Uh, you don't need to uh, do that. And electricity is over uh, subsidized as well. And that's part of the problem. So uh, they just need to get, uh, you know, they don't have to make this kind of adjustment that, you know, a neoliberal adjustment like the IMF would come in and everybody would suffer because they would try to, uh, you know, squeeze the economy and uh, promote some kind of internal devaluation like you have in Greece or something. I mean, they would, they would support this kind of devaluation as well. But th the point is, um, you don't need any kind of lowering of living standards. You can, they, they've already cut imports by over 60%. So the hard part has been done to adjust to the lower price of oil. What they really need to do is simply uh, get the relative prices adjusted so that you can have a functioning economy and get rid of the shortages and, and, and pull out of the recession. 
And what has been preventing the government from acting on what you're advising them sooner? Well, uh, you know, and I can't speak for them, so you would have to ask them. But you see this problem in a lot of countries. I mean, look at Greece. They've been in depression for more than six years, and the government still doesn't take the measures that they need. Now, obviously, uh, they, they might have to uh, leave the euro, for example, in order to do that. And if they did that, they would go through uh, a painful uh, period. It could be very short. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, things would get worse before they get better. So all uh, governments are afraid to adopt reforms that they think uh, might be unpopular. Devaluation has always been unpopular in Venezuela, just the idea of it. This is true in many countries, even when it's necessary. Even in the United States, you know, you have people think that it's good that we have a strong dollar, even though it's the main thing that's been responsible for us losing millions of manufacturing jobs. So, you see, uh, those are all the things I think that go into this. Uh, it's mostly a fear of the uncharted uh, territory. At its own uh, risk. So, Mark, I thank you so much for joining us, and we're going to be cover the, covering this issue um, in the weeks to come, so I hope you join us again very soon. Thank you, Sharmini. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.